Thank you, Brian. That's a, a splendid introduction. It saves me a couple of minutes. Um, uh, so uh, I am going to talk about a much broader subject than the last uh, uh, topic that was covered uh, yesterday, uh, and I'm a chemist, uh, and so uh, much of what we talked about yesterday was sort of central facilities and macromolecular diffraction based. I'm going to talk about chemistry, uh, mainly from the perspective of a university uh, laboratory based researcher, but I run a sort of um, UK national service where people submit stuff to us uh, remotely. Uh, so I come at this from a rather different angle, and I've been doing that for about 25 odd years, but about 15 years ago, I started getting involved in metadata and building um, data management systems, that kind of stuff, um, to provide this service. And that's kind of led me uh, into thinking about knowledge management and that kind of stuff in a more broader context. So I'm actually going to give quite a, a broad contextual uh, overview. Uh, and I want to think a little bit uh, about um, why do we do this stuff in the first place? And what is the context in which our experiment sits? As, as Brian mentioned, it can, be, uh, it can be pretty bored. So what was the motivation uh, and the reason behind uh, doing that? Uh, and I also want to touch on some of the things we don't manage to do very well. Uh, we have some very well uh, defined uh, approaches to capturing crystallographic information, but there are actually aspects of the experiments that we do that we don't uh, capture information about at all, and they can be utterly pivotal uh, to the crystallographic uh, result. Um, and a lot of that's not necessarily um, covered by SIF or other uh, ways of capturing uh, metadata uh, or the tools that we use to do it. Uh, and the one of the things we need to think about is uh, we don't know how other people are going to use our data in the future. Uh, so we need to future-proof it as much as we possibly can. Uh, and I'm saying we want to uh, catalog it uh, extensively, uh, if at all possible. Uh, data management is absolutely the key here. Uh, and my main message uh, in, in the context of this workshop is it's all about the context of the data and how you link all these data objects uh, together. So I'm not really going to talk about uh, diffraction images at all, I'm afraid, uh, but I'm going to talk about the context within which they, uh, which they sit. Um, many of the motivations have been uh, uh, gone over in, uh, yesterday. Uh, these are the ones that uh, I want to touch on. Uh, but what I'm going to do is run through a few kind of examples and real life case studies that say, uh, you know, why might we want to uh, think about this a bit more? So uh, I uh, mentioned that I run a, a national service and uh, this is kind of the stuff that we do. We take uh, samples, uh, is there a, oh, here we go. I'm not entirely sure how this functions. Uh, well, uh, we, we receive samples uh, from uh, people external to, uh, to our laboratory, uh, and they go to great lengths uh, to manufacture, you know, synthesize new chemical compounds, and they want, wish to, uh, to characterize them. So uh, the stuff that goes on here that's in somebody else's laboratory, it, it could be in the same building as me or it could be the other end of the, the country, uh, is absolutely crucial. You know, why do these guys actually go into the lab and make this stuff in the first place? Uh, really, really key. And they, they capture all their metadata in, uh, in systems like this. Uh, so we have a real challenge here in terms of uh, what did these guys actually do when they synthesized this chemical compound? Uh, you know, we're characterizing it, um, but we know very little about what happened in this environment. Uh, and I've deliberately uh, elongated this part of the process, because this is a bit I want to, uh, to stress a lot. We don't capture uh, very well uh, what we do uh, in the laboratory prior to getting something onto the diffractometer. Uh, you know, uh, this, is the, this is what the chemist thought they did. Uh, and this is what they, they predict uh, you're going to be looking at. It's very, very important that uh, we capture exactly what the chemist thinks they've tried to achieve. Uh, and when we uh, tell them that they didn't achieve that, uh, we can actually do a sort of compare and contrast and understand why uh, we got the result we did uh, when it was different from that which they predicted. Uh, and we'll, we'll start looking at samples like this. Uh, we obviously, we'll, we'll, so this is a, this is a whole, uh, whole batch, and obviously we'll pick a few specimens out of that. Uh, so you want 
to be sure uh, that we have specimens that are representative of the batch or know whether they're not, that, that kind of thing. Uh, and we can often do fairly brutal things to crystals to get them on the diffractometer. We're not necessarily always taking them in their natural uh, and as grown state, if you like. Uh, we can uh, uh, bash them up and, uh, and perform all sorts of surgery on them uh, to get the best kind of specimen for, on, on our diffractometer. Do we capture that information? Very rarely. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so I might here have a, what looks like a block of a crystal on the diffractometer, but I could have chopped that off the end of a rod. Uh, and uh, when we're thinking about how crystals grow uh, and doing database search, uh, database mining on, uh, uh, on this kind of information, the fact that I've recorded this in my SIF as a block uh, when it's actually a rod can be really rather misleading. So we don't capture much of this information. And I'm kind of taking it as a given that what happens up here when we actually zap these things with x-rays and, uh, and model the data um, is, uh, is relatively well captured. And I don't think this stuff uh, is. So I uh, run a fairly large facility by lab-based uh, uh, standards, uh, nothing like a, a synchrotron facility, but actually for an individual, uh, the amount that we do is quite significant. So um, the facility that I uh, oversee uh, probably collects around about three or 4,000 data sets a year. Now, for any one individual to kind of manage and retain all that is a very, very big task. Uh, and, you know, we, we have uh, storage solutions and actually our lab, uh, we have to, over the last few years, think uh, about how we get all those CDs and DVDs off the shelves and actually store these things online. Uh, and, you know, we have a, a great big data server in the corner of the lab uh, with a whole bunch of, you know, we just throw in new, more, more uh, terabyte sized disks every year uh, to maintain it. And it's all, uh, you know, it's a RAID NAS system. Uh, Etc. Um, but the point is, um, we have to keep and manage this stuff uh, for a very long period of time. Uh, good users, uh, so we're not in control of, how, of what actually happens to this data. We're collecting data on behalf of other people, and uh, they will generally control uh, when it's released out into the public domain and when it's published. Uh, the average lead-in time to publication is three years, but it's not at all uncommon for someone to mail me and say, you know, remember that structure you did for me ten years ago? I now desperately want to publish it, and you've got to claw back through your, your archives. So, uh, you know, when you have this sort of exponentially growing uh, volume of data, it's kind of important. Uh, and one key aspect, and I, I, I don't think this is, I think this is actually quite a representative figure, um, around about 80% of the stuff we do doesn't get out into the public domain through the formal um, publication kind of channels. Uh, and so I expect most chemical crystallography labs, 80% um, of their stuff is just sat on hard drives uh, gathering dust, if you like, um, through one reason or other. It might not be what the user, what, what a, the submitter of the sample uh, wanted to see uh, as a result. It could be an unexpected product, or they just didn't get around to publishing it. And this is, this is not an uncommon figure. I've done some, some sort of uh, informal uh, surveys on that. The other thing we do is we're part of a three-tier system in the UK. Um, so many of our users will uh, perform lots of experiments in, in their home lab, uh, and then they send basically what they can't do to us, uh, and we have more advanced facilities. So we're this sort of um, uh, in the, in the middle of the, the second tier of a three-tier system. Um, and if we can't do it on our advanced uh, facilities, then we go off to a synchrotron. Uh, so we have to think about data management across three different institutions more often than not. Uh, and, and when you're kind of trying to uh, bring everything together as a single study, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of important. Um, as I mentioned, we can only get about 80%. Uh, we, we have about 80% uh, unpublished uh, data. Uh, and uh, the affordances of the web mean that, that, is, that we have great potential uh, to actually get all of our data out there. We don't necessarily need to put everything out through the formal uh, journal publication channels. Uh, and so I've played around over the last few years by, uh, developing methods by which you can just basically put your data out there. Um, but this data needs to speak for itself. It doesn't have the context of a journal article uh, within which it sits. It's basically uh, a bunch of files. So we spent a lot of time thinking about the metadata that we need to uh, add to all of this stuff um, so that anyone who stumbles across it uh, can understand um, how the measurement was performed, uh, what the error in is, it, is in it, and, and so that it can be reproducible and, and reanalyzed and, and, and reused. Uh, and everybody understands what's going on there. 
Um, this is where I think uh, we need to uh, consider an, an awful lot uh, exactly how we uh, structure our metadata. Um, we see images like this every day. Uh, we deal with the stuff that other people can't deal with, uh, and we have uh, lots of uh, examples uh, that, that are much more challenging uh, and, and don't uh, comply with Bragg's uh, law um, wholly. Um, so, so this one's a very interesting example. We've been working on this system for about six or seven years now, uh, and we know that it is the world record holder uh, for the number of um, uh, molecules in the asymmetric unit, um, we just can't work out whether it, uh, how big that number is. Uh, and we've repeated this experiment, we've repeatedly grown these crystals time and time again. I've, I've probably got about 30-odd uh, different data sets on this thing, uh, and we have a number of different models. Um, I've now got to the conclusion that I need to uh, put some of those models out there, put the data out there, and tell the community, you know, look, we've got something really, really interesting here. I want to crowdsource the problem, if you like. Uh, and and can, you, uh, can, you re can you analyze these things in a way that I can't? Uh, diffuse scattering and, uh, and the likes is a really, really, really interesting uh, aspect. Uh, we, as I said, we see this day in, day out, whether it's um, due to uh, large void spaces filled as solvent in the structure uh, or um, more uh, disorder-based uh, effects. Uh, we see a lot of this. And, uh, you know, more often than not, my user wants to know, um, what have I made? So we, we just home in on the Bragg Peaks uh, and pull out some kind of connectivity for them. Uh, but in the future, I'd love to come back to these things or put them out there so that someone else can come back to them and find out what was really going on in there uh, from a structural chemist's point of view. Uh, and my personal research is actually into, in, in phase transitions. You know, uh, crystal structures aren't necessarily fossilized objects. Uh, in, in the real world, uh, we have many solid state uh, based applications where structures are actually changing and we need to understand what's going on there. And more often than not, we go through some kind of uh, state where we produce uh, diffraction patterns that look like this. Uh, and I want to be able to come back to these. And the big issue I have is how do I know uh, what to come back with? How do I uh, ascribe metadata to these data sets so that somebody will know that uh, they have a good chance of getting a tractable uh, solution or, or, or a good answer to this problem? Have I measured the data correctly in the first place? That kind of, that kind of thing. So when I or anybody else is coming back to it, uh, a few years down the line, uh, we need to know whether we've got a, a fighting chance of being able to, to do something with this data. Uh, and that kind of says the same thing. Um, we don't know how we're going to be working in the, in the future. I think we can get a lot more out of our, our data. We, uh, we pick and choose selectively what we want to uh, 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 extract from our images and, and make models out of them. I think there's a whole lot more that we could do with this. Um, like. Can we go back to the integration after we've started to, uh, after we've worked up a, a, a decent model? Can we, can we do? Uh, uh, can we get more out of our images? Uh, and there's a whole bunch of things that uh, are going to happen in the future that we can't necessarily uh, uh, cater for right now. But what I really need to talk to you about um, the charge that I was given by Brian um, is the context uh, by uh, within which this, these experiments um, actually sit. Uh, what is the, the motivation and what's the bigger scientific picture that, uh, that these diffraction data results actually uh, sit in? Uh, so we have actually started to go about trying to, uh, to think about this. Uh, so just a few slides on the crystallographic experiment itself. Um, we have uh, essentially um, metadata frameworks within which we try to capture information about uh, the, uh, the, the sample, how it arrived with, to us, um, what the bulk sample looks like, uh, and uh, mounted sample and trial diffraction patterns. This is the kind of information that most people don't capture in the first place uh, or throw away. Um, but actually, it, it's really, really very useful. And when you're providing a service for someone else, they want to know that you've tried your best, uh, and what, uh, what you've actually picked out of their sample, uh, um, and what you've looked at, and the results that you've got. Even the failures are important here. Uh, so. 
uh, we, we go about recording all of this and provide uh, reports for our users uh, on, on all this kind of stuff. So this is actually very valuable metadata. We might only have uh, a set of 10 screening images on this, but it's actually important for people to know uh, that you tried that particular looking specimen uh, from that particular sample and got this kind of result out of it. Whether you actually got a structural model in the end is not necessarily um, the, the point here. Um, so, uh, so, so to talk about the larger context, uh, in the last 10 years or so, I've been involved in writing electronic lab notebooks. Uh, and this is uh, a, a way of recording uh, what you actually do in the laboratory, all that sort of nebulous stuff that, uh, that doesn't happen um, automatically. It doesn't, it's, it's not computer uh, uh, driven. This is, uh, these are systems so that people can actually record their thoughts, their intentions, their observations uh, when conducting experiments. And, and this is where I say I got um, a bit distracted as a crystallographer and gone off into completely other, other different worlds. So I've been supporting people like climate scientists, and there's a bunch of physicists who publish um, uh, code, for, uh, and these are um, engineers who are, uh, who are describing what they're doing when they're um, test flights in, in model airplanes and stuff. Um, so, so uh, I just want to flick through a, a few examples uh, to, to give a feel um, for the kind of things that you can record in these systems. As I say, I've developed a very, very generic system. It can be used by anybody uh, doing any kind of research. It can even be used by machines. So this is uh, sensors automatically uh, logging what they do. I have colleagues who uh, perform laser experiments on the surfaces of, uh, of liquids. Um, what's happening in the room, the environment in the room, is incredibly important for them. They, they can analyze their data uh, in a different way if they know that, in, uh, that, that there were fluctuations in the, in the environment they're in. Um, some people actually use this as a sort of group collaboration tool. So these are some colleagues of mine in physics that I work with very closely are developing a sort of lab-based um, XFEL kind of thing in the lab. And so they're developing a, a technique in an instrument uh, and they use this system as a, as a group kind of collaboration tool. There's all sorts of uh, gems of information in here. Uh, and then you can have much more um, formulaic kind of uh, data. This is, a, this is a sort of biological assays. Uh, and you'll note in many of these, there's a whole bunch of stuff down the side here. So this is the metadata that we're capturing. So we don't have a, a, a formalized um, metadata scheme by which people fill in stuff. This is much more a sort of tagging-based system. Now, that's not necessarily uh, a great approach, um, but it's, it's the way, actually, a lot of people think about organizing their own personal stuff. You know, all your photos on Facebook have particular people tagged in them. Uh, so you can say, give me everything with, uh, you know, Simon Coles uh, in, in the image. Uh, and uh, and we, uh, we've adopted that approach here. But you can actually uh, add structure to that metadata after the, after the event. Um, so uh, just a few more examples. This is an open, open science project uh, whereby people are publishing exactly what they're synthesizing um, online. It's a, it's a Gates Foundation uh, project. Uh, and this is what we do more often in chemistry. So this is the context of the chemistry experiment. Uh, invariably, uh, I have colleagues who'll uh, go off into a lab, synthesize a new chemical compound through, uh, for, for whatever motivation and, and reason, and then they need to characterize it. Um, and X-ray diffraction forms one of the ways in which it is characterized. So this is the kind of stuff we grab in these uh, electronic lab notebooks. It's you know, the reaction that was performed in the laboratory, uh, what you thought you were going to do uh, when you walked into the lab, what you actually did, what you saw, uh, and the motivation behind it. Uh, and I played around with trying to pull all this together. So this is an alternative way of looking at the uh, supplementary information that goes into um, to many chemical synthesis papers. So this is basically um, three compounds, uh, new compounds, and these are all the different um, kind of uh, uh, techniques, uh, you know, all the different aspects of the, of the study. So there's the synthesis of these things, um, there's uh, some characterization, this happens to be, um, uh, this happens to be mass uh, IR, um, and some, some crystallography data. So you can see how all this stuff uh, has to be pulled together to give the full picture. Uh, and, and all of these things are sitting in electronic uh, online resources. So, so you can link through to all of these, uh, all of these lab notebook records or, or database records, and they all have their own kind of metadata. Uh, so 
uh, this is a, a warm-up for Brian, um, who's going to talk in a couple of talks' time. Uh, we have ways of capturing all this metadata um, at centralized uh, at central facilities, uh, and this is uh, pretty well structured and well understood. Um, but what it does provide, and, uh, and I don't think I'm talking out of turn here, um, is the basis for extensions to considering uh, derived data, what you do in your home laboratory, uh, and, and so we can, uh, one can envisage uh, metadata schemes that kind of plug into this central facilities uh, view of the world, because this is very well structured, very well organized, so basically, you know, I can plug all my metadata uh, into this system, and uh, I can uh, describe uh, what I did in the, uh, in the laboratory, um, all sorts of secondary kinds of uh, analysis and preservation, uh, what I did in terms of publication, that kind of thing. Uh, and so what we've spent a lot of time talking about, and this is the one thing I really want to uh, you know, want you guys to take home um, from my talk, is actually um, most of this comes down to a recording process. This is really, really important. So here's a, a, a noddy experiment of uh, you know, taking the pH of a, of a solution. So you have a solution, it's in this uh, vessel, and you can record a pH. And so what I'm doing here is uh, say I, I'm formalizing a plan. So I intend to go into the laboratory uh, and take the pH of this solution. So I'm going to take my solution, I'm going to, it's in this thing, and I'm going to uh, measure something. And, and we have um, relationships between all these uh, actions uh, which uh, we, can, we can formalize. I can then actually go into the lab and record what I do. Uh, so there's my intention and there's my uh, action, if you like. Uh, and then I can uh, compare the two. So that's a really, really, really very powerful thing. Uh, and so uh, this actually forms a, a way of, uh, of putting uh, structure to your metadata. So here's the process of doing a, uh, of doing a structure solution, if you like, sorry. Uh, that way. This is the process of doing uh, a structure solution. It's a fairly simple um, uh, process, we all go, uh, go through it, uh, but you can say um, this file was generated by this thing, it turned into this through this process, uh, and you can basically link everything together. Now this forms a much better way of structuring your metadata and packaging everything up uh, in a way in which you understand the relationships between all your stuff. Uh, we've talked about containers and putting your data and your metadata into containers, but that's basically like a trash can. Uh, it's full of stuff. You don't understand how uh, everything is, is related to each other, what came out of what process, uh, that kind of thing. So this is actually a way in which you can pull together all your digital objects and the metadata about them and say, this is my thing. You kind of have this map, and you can walk this map. Uh, and you can, So a computer can walk this map as well, which is, um, which is really important. So you can say, this is my result. How did I get there? Uh, kind of stuff. So I, I believe this is a good way of packaging things up, and I think it's a, a topic that this group should be considering because it, it adds the structure uh, to the metadata. I've been playing around um, with instrument manufacturers trying to capture all this uh, information. So we have a formalized scheme uh, by which we can say, this is, how, this is how I handle my samples. This is what it looked like in the, uh, in, in the tube. Uh, this is what it looked like under the microscope. This is the one I actually picked. Uh, and we have a way of, of doing all of that. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of metadata uh, associated with that. And now for a little bit more broader stuff. So I got very interested in knowledge management as a whole. Um, and I've been thinking about the whole of chemistry, not just crystallography, if you like. Uh, and so we've written a, uh, a paper and devised this, uh, this kind of um, hierarchical model uh, that says you, you basically need an advert uh, for your, your stuff. Uh, and that's what this ELN item manifest is all about. It's a bit like um, Dublin Core. It's a, a core set of about 20 odd terms that said who did what to what um, and, and what resulted. Uh, and, and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, and that is a kind of lead-in uh, to a much more detailed uh, metadata structure. Uh, this one, called S88, is all about how people do their reactions in the laboratory, uh, and uh, this stuff is about how we uh, characterize that information. So uh, this is all published, uh, and you can uh, openly access it uh, at this address for the, for the, uh, for the high-level uh, metadata scheme. But the S88 thing is quite a big 
uh, effort. So I'm involved with um, a whole bunch of very large pharma companies to understand this. The pharma companies are really, really keen on this uh, because they have real problems with their, their recording and exchanging information between sites and, uh, and having everything formalized for submission, filing patents, all this kind of uh, stuff. So they're very, very, very keen on it. And I'm uh, leading a bid to try and formalize this through IUPAC. But the bottom line is we can take a synthesis like this, which is basically a procedure, and turn it into something like this, which we can store digitally and, uh, uh, and actually compute over. Uh, equally, um, a lot of big pharma companies are thinking about their characterization techniques. So this is all the kind of spectroscopy uh, and, and diffraction stuff that goes on. So the Allotrope um, Foundation is, is basically a whole bunch of big pharma buying into uh, to finding a central, a sort of uh, common way of describing what they do uh, in the characterization lab. Um, and then we have uh, a bunch of hangers on. Uh, that can, can see what's going on here. But they basically employed a company with 40-odd employees to understand uh, how, uh, how you translate uh, metadata that's coming out of one instrument uh, to another uh, and what's the, the common framework for this. Uh, and they've actually made great advances. They, they basically uh, have a, a, great, a massive great metadata scheme uh, for all of uh, analytical characterization. Um, it's amazing what you can do when you throw uh, a lot of pharmaceutical company money at, uh, at a problem. Uh, and, they've, uh, and this is what they've done. They've documented standards, um, metadata. The first release of this came out last month. Uh, and uh, they've actually started to build some of the tools for doing this now. Um, and this is key to what they're doing. So there's a massive, great big metadata repository that says these are all the characterization techniques. This is how you translate between the two. And this is how you should record all your stuff. And um, for a bit of fun with my last slide, um, I'm, the, uh, I'm the, the leader of a project which is actually looking at how various different disciplines capture process information. Uh, and so you'll see that there's a whole bunch of things. So uh, this is me here, but I'm, uh, I'm working with guys from uh, STFC, Central Facilities, but also environmental scientists, artists, musicians, uh, and trying to work out how people structure their metadata uh, we have a platform where we can model all this stuff in it. Uh, and we look at these different models for metadata schemes. And, and I can say, oh, your data looks like this data. This is how this community deals with their data. You should do things like that. Uh, and so that's what we, we're trying to achieve with, with this project. Uh, and we are attempting to formalize all of this. So in chemistry, there's a, there's a big meeting uh, underneath the Research Data Alliance. Uh, which is an important body, They're, they kind of uh, tend to convene standards. So guys from the CCDC, RSC, and ACS uh, are convening a, a meeting where we're starting to talk about these kind of schemes and formalizing them for chemistry. I'm done. <laughs> Very much, Simon. That's covered very nicely the uh, the whole sort of explosion of points of contact between you know, the experiment and the and the wider world. Questions from the floor? Still gathering our thoughts after breakfast. I was very it interested. Is a Sunday morning after is, Saturday yeah. night. <laughs> I was very interested in your um, in your Oricam um, packaging, uh, uh, the way that that was described. So you're following a, a sort of workflow for the uh, for the experiment. Um, what, in in sort of computational terms, is the structure of that workflow that you're capturing? Are you using workflow software, or are these just sort of um, uh, steps along the way? These are these are basically just steps. So you, we we have a, a thing called a plan generator um, behind. So you, you you essentially say this is my target, this is what I intend to do, and I'm going to go through these steps on the way. You kind of formalize it. In chemistry, um, we're, we're sort of lucky because you have to risk assess everything that you're going to do before you do it. Uh, and so all our, all our PhD students have to fill in what we call in the UK as a, a COSH form. They basically say, I'm going to take this substance, and I'm going to add it to this substance, and these are the associated hazards. So I've been talking to the, the chemicals catalog providers. Um, they're very, very interested in, uh, in planning procedure because you're basically going to use their, their chemicals and you're going to do something with them and, uh, and you might uh, blow yourself up or uh, cause yourself some damage. So they're a bit worried about that kind of thing. Um, but we basically have to plan everything that we're going to do before we go into the laboratory, which is good scientific practice anyway. Uh, 
and they have to write all this down and, uh, and paper form. So we've basically developed an electronic system. But underneath the hood, it's all RDF. So that, that, that's a sort of um, a semantic way of structuring the data so that you can say these objects are related to each other in this way. Uh, and, and so that's how we actually record it in a computer science sense. A couple of short questions, John Helliwell. Um, the diffuse scattering, um, do you actually have a web page where you advertise that particular data sets have um, strongly featuring diffuse no, scattering? No, but I want to. <laughs> because obviously the um, uh, community of uh, people who do analyze diffuse scattering, you know, uh, they can't be expecting to trawl every day through all your measured data sets. You could advertise to them. Uh, this is what I want to get out of this group. Uh, you know, I want to... Uh, I'm not going to just put these things up online. It needs to be structured. So I need to say this is what we've observed in our images. Uh, this is what we think you might be able to achieve with them. Uh, and, and even simpler, you could have a flag which said um, data set S53121, et cetera, shows strong diffuse scattering features. Uh, at the simplest level, I believe we could. Uh, once you get lots of data sets like that, then you can't see the woods for the trees. So what no, I'm they can't even see in a mega number of trees, which is the kilo number of trees that... Yeah, so I, I believe we need more metadata on that. And, and what I'm not clear on is uh, uh, how we convey uh, the way in which we've conducted the experiment. I know I've done some diffuse scattering modeling myself, and you basically don't take the data that you first collect it uh, uh, and analyze it. So um, where I haven't quite uh, understood how we should go about this is, you know, I see this day in, day out, and I just collect a normal routine data set. It's like, oh, there's a load of diffuse stuff in. I'm just going to extract the brag peaks, tell my user what they've got, uh, and move on to the next thing. Is that data good enough to actually be able to analyze um, the diffuse scattering? Or do I need to go and do a better experiment and measure that diffuse scattering more accurately? Uh, and so Fair enough. that's but what anyway, I need step to one, work out. Step one is to, to raise the flag, and, and you have in hand the samples, the equipment, and you could receive then a dialogue with the uh, diffuse scattering analyst to make the better measurement, for example. The second thing... Uh, yep, sorry. I mean, I mean often uh, this will be discovered after the event. Uh, whether I still have that sample um, or not is the, is the other issue. I've got to make a decision there and then when I'm on the diffractometer. Um, you know, what do I measure right now? Uh, no, but I send them back to my users and they throw them away. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't keep 3,000 samples a year. Um, my safety officer would go nuts. <laughs> Uh, Mike Wall from uh, Los Alamos. So uh, I just want to sort of second this idea of tagging. Uh, I've thought for a long time that uh, I'd like to look at small molecules in addition to proteins, and I would really happy, happily uh, fetch those images and see what I can do with them. And uh, you know, I'd like to talk with you about the oh, potential for, sure. for doing yeah, that. Yeah. So yeah. I imagine people compete for time on your facility and therefore they make a proposal with some statement of why the scientific interest is there. That's correct. We, we operate much like a synchrotron. Hypothesis driven, let's say, or it's to complete a collection to form an induction driven scientific discovery process. Correct. Yeah. So do you um, collect as metadata that simple statement of why uh, this particular study? Absolutely. Between them? Um, it's not something that I formalize. I mean, I kind of waiting for a community consensus on what that metadata should actually be. But within our own in-house systems, yeah, we capture all that information and, and catalog it. I mean, there's no reason why we can't uh, catalog it in exactly the same way as a central facility does, for example. Um, we effectively do that. All that information is in our databases. So I'd like to introduce now um, Susanna Ward from the CCDC.